Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, where the topic is Six Essential Practices for Effective Project Portfolio Management. My name is Robert Stickle, and I'm also joined by my colleagues Jim Patterson and Paul Esterbrooks. During today's webinar, attendees will be on mute and the line will not be open for questions. However, feel free to use the GoToWebinar's question feature to submit any questions that you may have. I will address these during the webinar and will respond via email if we do not get to your specific question. If for some reason you get distracted or pulled away from the webinar, no need to worry as I'll be emailing a link to the presentation once it has been posted to our YouTube channel. I will now turn the presentation over to Jim. Thanks, Robert. Welcome, everybody. We're excited to bring you this topic today of six essential practices for effective project and portfolio management, uh, a key topic for folks in our industry today and how we evolve with the ever-changing landscape that's out there. So let's talk first about some of the key challenges we're going to be addressing. Uh, organizations continue to struggle to manage ever-increasing demand for initiatives that come their way. We're still limited by oftentimes inflexible budgets and capacity uh, uh, to deliver resources to these initiatives. Uh, consequently, the tendency is to overpromise and underdeliver uh, consistently. And we still struggle to balance the demand for continuous delivery that's really required of us in today's dynamic business environments while maintaining smooth, uninterrupted operations and getting leadership the business performance that we're looking for. It's really the lack of portfolio management uh, on an integrated basis across a variety of business practices, whether they be portfolios of projects, products, programs, services, what have you. It causes limited visibility to things like interdependencies, risks, and change impacts of doing things in any of these individual areas. So in the project and portfolio management landscape, many projects and portfolio, uh, project portfolios fail to achieve the expected business outcomes. And gaps in portfolio management practices may be the cause. Today's digital business uh, environment uh, requires that we continually adapt to an ever accelerating pace of change and that acceleration doesn't seem to be stopping. We must manage a variety of portfolio activities that deliver the right things at the right time for the expected outcomes. And integrated portfolio management and governance has a key role in the success here. Analysts have said if we get a handle on this, that well-governed portfolios can result in superior organizational performance. Um, and one of the metrics is say even a, an excess of 30% return on assets for organizations that do this well. So the digital business and the move towards it means traditional portfolio management, things that we've done for years may no longer be adequate. And portfolio silos cannot work in isolation any longer and provide a true picture of performance of the organization. We need to optimize the value for all major initiatives, and that requires integrated portfolio management. You know, it needs to continue to evolve as a function that balances your investments, your priorities, and your resources. And we need integrated portfolio management to be able to effectively decide what to start, what to stop, what to continue, what we need to maybe consolidate, or what possibly needs to change. And integrated portfolio management will prevent the use of silos or siloing of information. Now, uh, agile methods today, which are increasingly in use, are often outside of our conventional portfolios, and it can result in a lack of visibility of the resource utilization and the impact of the work being delivered using those methods. So we have to bring those into the fold in whatever modern method we're using today. So if we need to evolve portfolio management for digital business, we need to be flexible and adaptive. And we need to start by having an intake process, prioritization, and investment decisions on those that must align with both customer and business objectives. And we need to create an adaptive culture to assure that our resources can support changing customer needs and be able to respond to that change. Now, to do that, we need to track key performance indicators that are based on customer expectations. Today's modern landscape is really customer focused and it is really a customer centric world. We also need to have benefits realization with continuous feedback so that future prioritization decisions and business case assumptions uh, learn from our past experiences and or past failures so that we don't repeat them. So the Gardner Group has come up with six 
practices for effective portfolio management. And that was the inspiration for this webinar. And what they suggest, and we'll go into these in a little more detail, is that you as organizations that we all assess our portfolio management practices, that we understand and use these practices that we're gonna be described today, and that we have engaged team and stakeholders to determine specific changes for improvement that we need to make individually in our own organizations. We also need to identify and challenge the challenges and the root causes with delivering expected portfolio results. Because if we're not delivering as expected, why is that? And then we have to assess and identify gaps for each practices. And so for each of these, we're gonna talk about what we mean by these and maybe some self-assessment pieces that you can ask questions of yourself and examine to, to improve in all of these different areas. So we'll handle these one at a time. Let's first talk about visibility to work and constraints. You know, the concept there is if you can't see the work, you can't make decisions on what should be done and when. And we use the word work instead of projects here because they may be projects, they may be products, they may be services, they may be programs in this adaptive world with multiple portfolios, or maybe any other activities that need or consume resources. If we have lacking, deficient, or slow processes, it can drive people and organizations to go around processes just to get things done. And teams operating in silos lose sight of big picture and interdependencies and then can incorrectly prioritize because they can't see the impacts or what really needs to be done next. This can result in significant delays and ultimately unhappy customers. So we have to establish an intake process for comprehensive view of demand. We need to understand demand from all angles. And we need to understand the constraints that limit us, whether they be resources, uh, regulatory or compliance, whether they be operational continuity constraints that we can't disrupt, technology limitations, or even funding limitations. We need to understand all those as we make in our decisions. So with that, if we were gonna self-assess, questions we should ask ourselves. Is there an intake process in place and is it used consistently? Do we have visibility into work being done as in, and its status? Can we determine constraints associated with this work? And those could be interdependencies, they could be risks, they could be issues, they could be resource or financial constraints. So moving on to the second practice, customer-driven prioritization. Uh, ideas and requests often overwhelm organizations today. We get more requests for things and ideas than we can possibly do. We don't have funding or resources to do them all. So we might focus on a few initiatives because this can bring more benefits to us for dollars spent and for resources expended than spreading all of our resources across too many of them. Now, prioritization is often the difference between success and failures, but many organizations still do it poorly. S ultimately, satisfying customers is vital to our success, and that should be the end goal. So we must prioritize according to our customers' demand. And we also still also have to align with our organizational vision and priorities so we can succeed as an organization. We also have to determine what has the highest chance of uh, meeting the biggest customer needs. Uh, what are the biggest rocks or the biggest bang for our buck to basically uh, satisfy our customers and to deliver the most value? Now, to do this, prioritization should be quantitative and not qualitative. And we should try to limit uh, uh, this emotional decision making in this process. So questions to ask here is, do we have a clear definition of our customers, both internal and external? Do we have a committee of some type to determine what, where to make the investments? Is uh, our funding model flexible enough to adapt to varying types of portfolios? We mentioned the different types of, of some of the types earlier on. And are we using quantitative decision models to prioritize our work? Are they prioritized on customer goals? And it is as a, a aligned to our own internal strategic objectives. The third practice is adaptive resource allocation. And resource management for many, many years has been a major challenge for most organizations. Agile methods are compounding the problem. You know, our adaptive resource management continuously or continually identifies and assigns the right level of resources. But this must go beyond just simply applying resources to individual initiatives. We really have to create an environment for optimized and dedicated product teams that cross product lines and programs and initiatives to make sure that we have uh, well run teams and uh, high performing teams that deliver things consistently and understand the work that's being done. Now, as we increase the number of methodologies, waterfall, agile, and some hybrids around those, as we increase those, so does the complexity of managing resources. So being adaptive is about embracing and responding to new information, market shifts, and changing customer needs that we have to respond to. 
Adaptive is really about being able to be nimble enough to be respond to those change and take advantage of opportunities brought about by that change. So questions to ask ourselves here. Do we have an approach for allocating resources for all methodologies used in the organization? And can we, if we're honest with ourselves, shift resources easily based on changing priorities? Practice number four is the continuous execution of value. So all along the process, when we're actually executing on work, we need to assess whether value is actually being delivered. Uh, it's critical to keeping our portfolios relevant and valuable to the organization. We need to make sure that what we're doing is delivering value. Now, the initial determination of value starts with that intake request or the business case and or the charter that we put together. And we must validate with the sponsors as work progresses. Is that indeed happening? Um, not just at the detailed execution level, but at this portfolio level, we should really embrace the concept of a weekly portfolio standup of what is being delivered and what roadblocks that we're facing. Because without regular interaction, we often run the risk of resources being wasted and realization of value being delayed. So leading indicators of portfolio health should include things like value capture, status of those initiatives, strategic alignment, resource management and capacity aspects of that, and any risk profile we have. And portfolio dashboards are the key, and we're gonna show you some of those types of things here today. So questions to ask yourself about continuous execution of value is, is our portfolio roadmap aligned with expectations of our business sponsors? And then is it aligned with our strategic goals and our business objectives? And do we check in at least weekly with our business sponsors? Practice number five, change enabled culture. And culture is one of those often underestimated dimensions of implementing change. And we have to balance delivery with organizational change because it's vital to the success of any transformation program. Now, changes can have unintended consequences and we really must think ahead and plan for those to avoid or minimize their impacts. We also need to consider how our initiatives will affect customer and employee experiences along the way. And culture change at its core is often a complete prerequisite for success. And a change enabled culture would include things like establishing feedback and communication channels with our business leaders, managers, and end users, engaging multiple levels of change champions, and be able to develop an agreed to roadmap for change with our business leaders so that what we're executing on is supported and expected top down and bottom up through the organization. Now, do we have an approach in self-assessment of this? Do we have an approach of change management? Are the roles and responsibilities clear for affecting that change? And can you determine when there's too much change and can we throttle up and throttle down and look at this thing by role and process? Now, practice number six, continuous value realization. Now, uh, analysts have found that, uh, and I think a study Gartner did, only one in three organizations report high maturity in the benefits realization discipline. You know, we talk to people every day that want to do this and then end up not having the wherewithal to follow through on it. But as digital business evolves, effective portfolio management and measuring results will be more important than ever because things change so quickly and we have to be able to respond. The increased pace of change means organizations will expect even faster results from us, meaning we can't delay. Clearly define who owns and tracks actual benefits. Somebody has to be responsible for owning the tracking of that and capturing that information. And to use that information, and it's critical that we learn from mistakes and allow them to inform and impact our future decisions. We also need to understand why benefits may, may not have been realized and revisit the initial assumptions. You know, did we understand the customer needs at the outset? Have market conditions changed on us in the interim? Uh, did we overestimate value of what we were delivering you know, at its core? Or were there more risks or complexity than we anticipated? Things like this should be asked. Uh, as we're going through continuous value realization. Self-assessment questions we might ask is, do you have any way to measure value being delivered? Are metrics focused on customer needs? Have you identified accountable owners for tracking benefits realization? And is there a feedback loop to validate or disprove original business case assumptions? Do we go back and check, did we deliver against what that case was? If so, what, was the best, what is the best way to learn from our mistakes? So these are just some of the concepts we need to consider in a uh, portfolio management environment that's ever changing and evolving. And to do that, Paul's gonna demonstrate to you today one plan uh, for adaptive portfolio management, a solution that connects all the way from the strategic level all the way down through execution 
and helps you enable and is an enabling technology for putting in those six uh, practices in place within your organization. For facilitating enterprise transformations, let's just look at the methodology uh, approach. You know, traditional waterfall PPM type of approaches use waterfall type planning tools and one plan can support you there. A more adaptive approach where you have mixed methodologies and using a variety of tools, whether it be agile, waterfall, or other tools that you're using there, it's supported by one plan as well. For people that are looking to do full agile transformations and ultimately do everything in an agile fashion uh, and using agile execution tools, maybe even a variety of them, one plan can support the portfolio management capabilities for you along that journey. Because ultimately, when you have mixed methodologies, you need to support not only the teams that are delivering and those methodologies, you also have to get visibility and metrics and direction and funding across a variety of different dimensions. You know, roll these things up through programs or through different strategies or strategic themes. Be able to aggregate one or more portfolios and make sure that they align with specific corporate strategies and or goals. One plan can help us to do this. The one plan modules of portfolio planning, resource planning, and financial planning at the portfolio level, and even different modes of portfolio planning, whether they be KPIs and schedules, whether they be more portfolio boards for more program increment planning and other types of uh, exercises, or roadmap functions for more product-oriented type of organizations. Tying together with all the bottoms-up work execution pieces that, uh, uh, that are needed in order to deliver those things and provide visibility for decision-making to our leadership. We can even layer on the strategic portfolio management aspect on top of all of that. So for example, we could have strategy execution where we identify objectives and key results or OKRs and measure those tangible progresses towards achieving those objectives. And we can also then align those strategies and objectives with specific projects and initiatives to make sure that we're working on the right things. Now, one plan is built for the Microsoft Cloud and it can be used either standalone within your browser or uh, it can be fused in your user experience where uh, your users live and do their work every day in the Microsoft environment, whether it be within Power Apps, whether it be within their Dynamics tools, whether it be in Azure DevOps for Agile, or increasingly more as people are collaborating within Teams, it can be part of that hub of information. So you can stay working in the tools that you work in every day. So Paul's gonna to demonstrate to you now how one plan supports essential practices that uh, Gartner has identified in that. And those essential practices will be uh, the way we can support visibility and also to the work constraints around that work, customer-driven prioritization and different prioritization models that can be used, adaptive resource allocation, continuous execution of value and determining whether or not we're delivering value, a change-enabled culture using some insights and in artificial intelligence, for example, to uh, uh, see whether or not we're uh, optimizing our new methods of doing things. And just continuous value realization as we go on to basically capture benefits and be able to communicate those uh, to our organizations and to our customers. So with that, I'd like to hand it off to Paul and uh, let him show you some of these things live and in action. Thank you very much, Jim. Good day, everyone. I'm going to walk through the demo as, as Jim described it. As we go, I'll try and tie this back to some of the things you would have seen in those screenshots and link to some of those strategies uh, as I work through this. So I'll, I'll do my best to try to tie that back and help you understand sort of where we are. I've logged into one plan. I'm going to start here. I'm going to start at the at the top, let's say, around where I'm going to articulate the objectives of this organization and then show how we can tie to those as we go on this journey. So I'm in, uh, I'm in this particular section here where I can articulate our strategy. And with that, I have a series of objectives that we have articulated that said, these are the things we as an organization would like to accomplish. And underneath those, we are tracking a series of key results that we want to see uh, achieved that drive the accomplishment of the objective. So we start in this model with the ability to, to define what it is we as an organization are trying to do and how will we measure that and are we successful. And we can actually track these particular key results and provide a status report on them and, and status this as an entity unto itself, or we could link projects to this and say it's the completion of those projects and the capture of the benefits 
that we were that we articulated would be accomplished with that project that result in the key result that achieve the objective. So we have that that full linkage here, but I wanted to start with showing you the objectives and the key results underneath that, and then we'll show how the projects are linked to those objectives as we move forward. So that's part one as we go through this exercise of of alignment and, and, and realizing value and benefit, it starts with understanding where we're trying to get to and what, what, what does success or completion mean. The second part that Jim talked about in his slide decks, right, wrong click. The second part is this idea of intake. Do we have the ability to capture all of the things that we're being asked to do? And so I'm in our intake module where I could come in here and define a particular initiative or, or new idea, and this is configurable to be the kinds of information that you might want to, to capture and potentially link it to a key result or an objective, and then put it through a governance workflow, as you see at the top of the screen, where we assess it, we review it, we add some more information to it, and then we either approve or reject this idea, and that moves it forward, obviously, if it's approved, to become a project or an initiative that we're going to execute on. So the very first thing that Jim talked about in that wheel of six items was the ability to consistently capture the requests and the information of the projects or initiatives that are coming at you as an organization and to be able to get your arms around that in a consistent manner. The tool provides that capability here with the ability then to link it to business units, to other programs, or you can see here to a specific objective that we want this particular initiative is linked to. Okay, so you can see it's linked to one here. So now I'll move into the portfolio. So we've we've captured our objectives, we have our key results, we've we've implemented a method for capturing intake. Now these are the projects that have come in. I don't want to just switch this to see everything. I have them organized in portfolios. Underneath that I have programs, and underneath that I have my projects or epics and how we're executing this. As you can see on the left-hand side here, we are supporting uh, a myriad of end-user tools to execute and complete this work. Our objective here from a portfolio perspective is to provide that, that oversight, to consolidate that information, to truly understand what's going on, whether it's you know budget health, as you see on the screen, or overall project status, and other information to roll that up, but to grant the teams doing the execution the freedom to use the tools they need to based on the methodology they might be following uh, and other, other metrics to choose what they need to use to get the work done. So I'm here, I'm looking at this. And if I drill into a project and dive a little bit deeper, there's a few things I wanna show. First of all, is that capture of information, going back to the first uh, two items that, that Jim highlighted when he was looking at Gartner's paper, Again, capturing that information and linking it to objectives. So once again, this particular project is linked to specific objectives from our strategy methodology, from our OKRs. These objectives will be met or in part met or contributed to by this particular project. We have governance here in the workflow and we're capturing other information about this project. And there's a couple of things I wanna tie into quite, quite carefully. First of all is, the, is finance stuff. So we have built into one plan this ability to capture different financial metrics or metrics in general. I'm gonna first look at budget. So the idea that I can articulate our budget in a time-phased fashion over a set of cost categories and expense types. And then I can do forecasts. But we've also built in here this idea of benefits. And this gets into the fourth objective that, that Jim spoke about is, is that alignment and that realization of benefits. So you could see here fairly simple demo data, but we're expecting this project when complete to realize a benefits in, re, in revenue. And maybe this is a benefit that will occur and accrue during the project or potentially afterwards. It could be cost savings, it could be revenue, it could be reductions in other types of things, there's all kinds of ways you could track benefits here, but this gives us the ability in this specific project to determine what the benefits might be and to uh, track those as we go either during the project and or after the project, which was a key criteria of what Gartner had in their paper. Next on this list is resource planning. They called this out, it was a whole section there and I wanted to spend a bit of time here. Here we have, 
we have our our look at our different schedules, and I'm just going to close this up for a second just so I can look at it. In this particular project, we have a lot of resources on this. So I'm going to pull this over. But what we've done is we have our resources here, and I am looking at the kind of work that they are scheduled to work on, and you can see how that compares to capacity. I could put this to committed, which is where I kind of want to spend a bit more time, and see that I have my, my same set of resources. Here is when I first set up the project, if you want to call it committed or estimated. This is the work that I want these resources to do. There's a combination of generic resources or proposed resources and named resources. So we're starting to understand first at this project, what skills does it need? What named individuals have been put on it? How much work they need to do? And where else are they busy? And we see that being highlighted here. Very user-friendly interface for a PM or a, or a business sponsor or whoever's working on this to look at it and see clearly we've got some resourcing challenges if we're going to move forward with this project in the time frame we were hoping, given other commitments in the organization. And I immediately see that as I start to plan out what I'm doing. And then I could start to look at this and say, uh, how does this compare to other things? So maybe I want to compare it to what's been actually scheduled or what's come in in terms of timesheets. I have some flexibility there. But very critical to what Gartner talked about around tying this back to resource planning and resource execution. And so if I jump down and I look at the resource plan in its totality, now as a PMO, I can dive into this at a much higher level and see across my organization uh, what each and every resource is working on and where they are committed, which projects they're on, where they might be proposed, what's causing the over-allocation, and what shifting of priority or shifting of assignment do I need to take on as an organization to ensure that these, resource, these projects get done and that we have the people we need, where might we need to hire, what are the roles that we're struggling with, and how do I adapt uh, the resource pool to align back to that value and what we're trying to accomplish uh, and optimize what I'm working on. And jump back to the portfolio. One of the other things that they talked about was uh, prioritization and, that, uh, and the importance of that. So I'm going to switch this to a prioritization view. So now I can look at my prioritization here. I'm going to add a column. We have a multitude of methods here that we might do prioritization. So the first I want to look at is say, um, I've, got, I've done some strategic alignment. I, I've looked at this from a variety of metrics. It's created a prioritization score. So I can stack rank my projects based on where they score. A very conventional prioritization model. I could also then turn and say, you know, Based on a discussion or a meeting, a business priority or a shifting thing, I can move a prioritization down to a different location and say, we're going to move that down the list because it is, you know, something's come up and we need to move something up the list. So I have that capability here to take a project and move it. I also have the ability to look at this based on financial plans. I'm going to switch this for a second back to budget. And I'm going to come in here and say, I have my 2021 target. And I want to work on getting my projects aligned. Uh, obviously, I've got an issue there in January. So I might want to start to eliminate a few projects from this list. So I'll look at some of the proposed ones and say, we can't do those based on some budget constraints that we have. So let's start to try and sort that out. And you'll see as I'm doing that, it's adjusting my overall totals of what's included in this particular scenario I'm considering uh, and how that's starting to align to budget. Uh, we're getting closer. Obviously, I'm still quite a bit out on the total, so I might want to keep working on this as I pick away at trying to get to where I need to go in terms of the overall budget. I could then turn around and say, well, I've gone as far as I can with that. What if I started to look at shifting the timing of a project? So maybe I want to move a project uh, out to a different time frame uh, and make, make some adjustments doing that. So I'm going to move this proposed project out and see how that affects my overall budget and so forth. So I could start to shift timing of projects again to move. My budget's fine later in this year, in fact, just with demo data. So I need to move some things out and restart them a little bit later. So I have the option to do that over budgeting. 
I also can do this using resources, the resource plan. That same data we were just looking at, it start to look at which projects I include. Uh, do I shift timing of those projects based on resource availability? So a minute ago, we looked at the resource plan in the context of projects are in flight, I need to move resources around, reassign tasks, reassign uh, who's on which projects to execute. This takes a bit of a, a broader view and allows me the ability to shift the timing of upcoming work based on the forecast demand that we have against the resource pool and its capacity and make sure that we aren't starting projects or green lighting projects for which resources aren't available. So we can sort of step back and plan and move forward in a slower method. While I'm here, I'm gonna to shift to just a slightly different uh, view. I'm gonna go back to my financial view. You mentioned this in his, I, you know, in an ongoing realization of benefits. So I could set a target here of, of benefits that I wanna to track to for the year. And are we accomplishing that across the portfolio? So if I look at my active projects, are we achieving the benefits that we are expecting? And we've, I set a very simple uh, target list are we getting there each month? And I've seen clients use this methodology to look at the accumulation of benefits based on the projects as some as they incur benefits during the project and others as they wrap up. Are we achieving those targets as we progress through the year? Here we can set that target and we can monitor that information. So we have a lot of capabilities there that gets into uh, items five and six on that, on that wheel. Jim mentioned insights as a method of change management. Change management is a much broader topic in terms of how you would tackle it, but I think insights does play a very key role. And here you could see this is an area where we continue to invest and build it out. Uh, is this idea that we can drive compliance, drive behavioral change, uh, drive in constant improvement and continuous improvement across the organization by using AI and, and and business rules in the background to look for areas where tasks are, are overdue, as you can see they're on the list. Uh, they're due this week, are we aware of them? Tasks may be scheduled during the past and we wanna move them forward. And other compliance requirements so that we are constantly getting better as we adapt to this changing pace in our PMO. So change management's a broad topic. The Gartner paper talks a lot about that in terms of different ways, but this is a piece of that puzzle, is our ability to, to look at uh, where we are, where we are weak, and how do we get stronger, where do we get better in terms of the information we have, and learn from these projects. This is an area we continue to invest in to look at ways that, that the data we're capturing in our projects around actuals and information teaches us about how we can do things better, how we can better use resources, how we can plan better, how we can prepare better for the work that's coming up. It's an area that we continue to invest in and it shows a lot of promise. I'm gonna end this demo on some of the dashboarding and just log in quickly here. And you can see all of the types of reporting that are capable to provide that additional insight. This gets into that alignment uh, and the continuous realization to see, you know, where are ideas coming from? Uh, how does our portfolio look? Uh, where are we executing, go to portfolio details, some of the other reports that we have here, what's our overall status, uh, are we achieving our value that we set out to, are we aligned, if our alignment has changed, how does that shift? So we have a multitude of reports in here that we make available and, and the ability with Power BI to extend that further and even draw in data potentially from other sources to help with our understanding of benefits, to help with that alignment uh, with our organization and where we are going. We've covered a lot of ground fairly quickly in this demo. I wanted to show people a, a broad range of things from articulating strategy at the outset, being consistent in how we capture that intake, uh, mapping our initiatives and projects back to strategy of that alignment and making sure we, we monitor and maintain that alignment looking at how we manage resources and comparing that to capacity and being prepared to shift as a project shift with changing resource demands, but also to plan correctly up front to make sure that we take on work we actually can staff when we can staff it. Uh, tracking benefits both during and at the conclusion of projects, as well as learning from how we get better in these initiatives uh, and how we get better at doing project executions through the insight capabilities 
and concluding here on some of the reporting that we have capable in the tool to show you uh, the richness of this data and what you can learn from it and glean from it and how you can communicate with your organization your overall portfolio strategy and its alignment. And with that, Jim, I'll turn it back to you. Thanks, Paul. Appreciate you bringing those concepts to life. So with that, let's uh, summarize and talk about some possible next steps. So, you know, in summarization of some of the concepts here, you know, digital transformation and the pressures to move in that direction is driving the need to evolve our portfolio management practices. Now, organizations that get complacent and stay in their old ways of doing things through this evolution will in get increasingly poor results. And so the increased pace of change that both uh, I and Paul talked about and then Gartner, uh, Gartner sites uh, requires more adaptive approaches. And Gartner has identified the six essential practices that we highlighted for you today. Organizations and the, result, and the cultures must change in order to be effective in really making uh, lasting and meaningful change. Uh, Paul showed you that one, one plan provides capabilities that will support these essential modern portfolio management approaches and that the people, process, and technology must all be addressed. You know, as we talked about, we can't just you know, think of a tool as coming in and making all those changes, but the tool can definitely enable and facilitate the effective adoption of change. And that's where something like one plan can really streamline that process and help you enable and get there quicker by having a central hub of all these information uh, types and capabilities. So changes that are needed, you know, to get out of the old ways and move into the future. Program and portfolio management leaders and others responsible for portfolio management for all the different portfolios, as we mentioned, products, programs, projects, services, et cetera. We must evaluate our internal capabilities by assessing how well Gartner's six practices are being applied in our own organizations. And we should develop an action plan based on our own situation to increase portfolio management effectiveness. Whether we engage the staff to review internal practices or identify practical steps for improvement, we should get on the journey for change. So if you were interested in trying some of the things technologically that you saw today, you can go out to Microsoft's App Source and get a free trial of the Adaptive Project Portfolio Management solution from OnePlan. Uh, it's available to you and we're happy to support you or chaperone you through that and help you get the best experience that you might want uh, on your uh, investment of time in that trial. So as a next step, you can go get that trial out on AppSource, or you can reach out to us and we'll facilitate getting you that trial. We also offer a roadmap workshop. So if you're interested in saying, God, what would it take to get into a solution that would allow us to uh, help facilitate some of these changes? We're happy to offer you a free roadmap workshop to see where you're at and help determine what it might take for you and get you an idea of what that might look like. Also, we gave a very generalized demo today, Paul did. And if you'd like a more personalized one-on-one -on -one demonstration that addresses specifically your requirements and your use cases, we're happy to schedule that with you as well. We really hope to engage with you. Uh, for more information, you can reach out to us or make a request on any of these areas at contact at oneplan.ai. And you can check out more about our solutions and our organizations and the things we help people with and case studies, et cetera, out at uh, oneplan.ai, www oneplan.ai. Uh, thanks again, as always. We don't take for granted the valuable time that you invest with us at these things, and we hope you did get that value out of it today, and we truly do hope to engage with you and help you on the next steps in this journey. Have a great day.